that's sort of the same message I had for all of us this morning. Um, hopefully I can do a little better. <laughs> You'll understand what I'm talking about. Scripture lesson this morning is from 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And we are going to be thinking about how we're living and living for the Lord. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for all these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of the Lord as salvation, not just, uh, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, and he wrote to you. So may God add his blessings to the reading of his word this morning. Francis Schaeffer, I guess some 50 years ago now, wrote a book dealing with culture and what was going on in our world called How Shall We Then Live? And I didn't want to try to steal his title or do justice to it, but I want us to think about this morning, how are we living in the light of the resurrection? Uh, I'm not jumping straight to Easter and the resurrection. We got nine or ten weeks till Easter. We'll go through Lent, Ash Wednesday, Lent, Passover. We'll deal with some things more specifically during the Lenten season, how we conduct our lives and what we're doing in our lives every day. And this is a, also, is it a uh, course on the second coming or Advent Christian theology. It's not AC theology. The, this month's or this quarter's witness addresses a lot to do with the second coming. I will refer to an editorial from Justin Nash. Also, there's two wonderful articles in there from John Gallagher, the president of the denomination now, about the sure and certain return of Jesus, and an article from Ron Thomas, who was Steve Lawson's predecessor as director of the denomination. So, two wonderful articles, The Sure Return of Jesus and The Soon Return of Jesus, that I would recommend to you. But this morning I want to deal specifically with a couple of things. And there's been things that have happened this week things I've had to deal with, things I've seen and heard about, and along with reading the witness and reading you know, the introduction to our Bible study book, it's made me think a lot about how we're living and what we're doing in light of Jesus' resurrection and also in light of Jesus coming again. And so these certainly... Uh, guide my thought today. Our Bible study that we're just starting is Resurrection, Living as the People of the Risen Lord by Christy Berglund. 
Also, the editorial from Justin Nash is entitled, Living in the Light of the Second Coming. And as I read and thought about those two things, I thought, they're one and the same. They go together. You can't separate one from the other. Let me uh, read in beginning a couple of excerpts from the study from Christy Berglund, the beginning of getting the beginning of uh, resurrection living as the people of the risen Lord. And listen very carefully to their words. The power of death has been broken. Life was victorious. How are we to live in the light of that glorious day? How does Christ's great victory play out in our everyday lives? How does the resurrection of Jesus and looking forward to the second coming play out in your everyday lives? What does it mean to you? How does Christ's great victory play out in our everyday lives as people of the risen Lord our identity and our calling are noted and rooted in the resurrection. We are the people of God's new creation living in the midst of a world still reeling from the long-standing effects of sin and death. As we receive healing and experience our own transformation in Christ, we show his risen life to others. Are you showing the risen life of Jesus to people that you come in contact with and people that you work with, people all around you? Now let me go to Justin Nash. This is an article from The Witness uh, Living in the Light of the Second Coming. The Second Coming and the Resurrection go together. We talk about that every Easter. From Justin Nash, every moment of my temporal life here and now should be lived in the view of eternal life that has already been promised to me. What Jesus has already accomplished by his death and resurrection and what we are so looking forward to, our everyday lives and what we do, how we speak, what we accomplish in our everyday lives should be rooted in the fact that Jesus gave his life for us to pay for our sin. Jesus rose again, and Jesus is coming back again to take us with him to his eternal kingdom. All of those things in mind, how should we then live? As I mentioned, there have been several things that have happened this, this week that has not, I would say, shaken me to the core, but just has made me again remember that this life is short and things change and things very, change very quickly. Let me begin from the excerpts. I've already read the excerpts from Berglund and Justin Nash and they so appropriately talk about how we live in light of the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is a certain fact. Jesus talks about it, the angels address it. Let me read a couple of passages to you. First of all, in Jesus' own words, in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus definitely states that he's coming back. Also from Acts, at the Ascension, Acts chapter 1, and after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, 
and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was gone, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, presumably they were angels. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come again, just as in the same way as you watched him go into heaven. Jesus is coming back again. Bodily, visibly, everybody will know. It's not going to be in secret. In the book of Luke, Jesus talks again, and he says, Your redemption draweth now. Luke 21, beginning in verse 25, There will be signs in the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and on the earth dismay among the nations, in perplexity, and at the roaring of the sea and waves, men fainting from fear, and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, and with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. We've already been redeemed, because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. But redemption drawing nigh has to do with the final, finality of Jesus coming back again and setting up his eternal kingdom. Someone has said we're living in the already done but not yet fully accomplished. Jesus' death on the cross in his resurrection make our salvation and our relationship with the Lord possible. When he comes back again, redemption will be completed and we will live with him eternally in his kingdom. One more scripture that speaks to the suddenness of this all and how this will happen familiar scripture in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. We, we want, don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even so God will bring with him those who will fall asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who fall asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven and with a shout and with a voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with those in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. And then the writer Paul goes on to say, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We know he's coming. We know he's coming soon. We don't know exactly when. That was a very serious mistake that someone made close to 200 years ago. That we don't do those things. But we know that Jesus is coming back and he's coming soon. Soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Let's go back to our scripture lesson now. What I want us to see for the rest of our time together this morning, as Christy Bergman has said and asked the question, how 
that we live as people of the resurrection. And Justin Nash says that we're supposed to live in light of the second coming of Christ. What does that mean? We'll talk more about specifics during Lent, about things we need to change in our lives and how specifically we need to live. But listen again to Peter. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is giving us time. I read a story in, a, in an article about a girl who went to church the first time shortly after her parents had both died, <coughs> said they died rapidly. And she went to the church, heard the message of salvation, and was impressed and came to know Jesus, except the Lord Jesus as her Savior. But after she had had time to think about all this, she wrote an open letter to that church and asked the church these questions. If you believe this so much, if you know this is true, if you know that Jesus is your Savior and he came to earth, gave his life and saved to save sinners from their sins, if you know this for a fact, why did we living two blocks from your church never hear this message? My question to us to myself, is why do so many people all around us not hear the message of salvation? If Jesus has done so much for you, and you understand that you have been saved from your sins by the finished work of Christ on the cross and his subsequent resurrection from the dead, if you know that, if you've experienced that in your own life, what keeps that, what keeps you from sharing that with everybody you come in contact with? And if you're trying to do that every day, if you're living your life in the light of the resurrection and in the light of Jesus soon coming to be the king over the whole earth for eternity and thereon, if you know these things, my goodness, we need to be more forceful and more forthright in sharing those things. Peter puts it this way, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away. He began this passage talking about the worldwide flood of Noah's day. And he says, Now the day of the Lord will come with a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar and elements, and destroyed with heat, intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since these things are be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? What sort of people ought you to be? But according to his promise, here's the good news, the wonderful part of this we can share with everybody, but according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Are you tired with all the garbage of this world? I'm sometimes exhausted just hearing about and reading about. When this earth passes away, all things will become new. We will live eternally with our Lord and Savior in His new kingdom. Isn't that a wonderful message to share with our friends, our loved ones? I'm sure we all have somebody that we 
are praying for, that we're worried about. And I'm glad God is patient. Yeah, I'd like to be in the kingdom. But don't we all have somebody that we love? And we want them to come to know Jesus as their Savior before the Lord comes back again. We have a glorious message to share. We need to live in the light of the resurrection and in the light of the soon coming of Jesus again. Amen.